So the Lord gave this to me uh, last week, I think, and I didn't get to preach it last week. Uh, he gave, put something else in my heart, and I felt like he wanted me to preach it this week. And so we're in Acts 19. We're looking at a verse, verses 11 through 20. And the Bible says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So let me give you a little background of what's happening here. Paul, Paul had followed the Lord's leading and came into the city of Ephesus. And having uh, met some of the disciples that had been led to the Lord by, the, by a guy named Apollos, he uh, asked them if they'd ever received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I think we talked about this last week. And um, he, he taught them about uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He stayed in the city. And he began to teach them about Christ in the synagogues, as was his custom. And as was his custom, he was kicked out of the synagogue, and so he found a school of Tyrannus. And he began to set up shop there, and he began to teach the Bible. And the Bible says for the two years, Acts 19 and 10, this continued for two years. So he would teach every day, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, obviously that doesn't mean that he preached to everyone but he preached, and those that heard him preach would preach. And by the time it was all done with, everybody in that region had heard the word of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? As he continued to proclaim the word of the Lord, God was working through Paul. And not just a, and let me just put this in a way for you to understand. Not in an ordinary, miraculous way. Think about that. That's an oxymoron to many of us. The miraculous is supposed to be ordinary. It's supposed to be natural. It's supposed to be the normal way of a Christian's life. I've been reading a, a book on what was happening at uh, Azusa Street, and there was a guy that was uh, ta talking about the stories there. Uh, people that were in Azusa Street told him the stories, and he wrote them down, a guy named Tommy Welchel. He was talking about this one lady, and he was saying to her, and apparently she was, uh, most of these people were young at the time. They were, in their, they were teenagers, 15, 13, 15, 14. And um, so he was talking to one, and he asked her, how often did you see the miraculous at Azusa Street? And she said, well, I was there three to four times a week, probably about three times a week. And just the ones that I prayed for, probably three, two to three times every day that I was there for three and a half years, I saw the miraculous. I saw miracles take place in people's lives. So that means anywhere between seven and nine times a day, just her, and there were multitudes of people going around praying for people, but just her, she saw God do incredible miracles through her prayers as she prayed for people. That to me, for us, would seem, wow, that's miraculous. That's not ordinary. It should be ordinary to where it gets to a point where when God does something even greater than that, it becomes extra ordinary. Right? God was working extraordinary, or in New King James's unusual miracles. Not just normal miracles, but unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. 
with Paul's success casting out demons demonstrated before them, there were some Jewish exorcists who they had their own rituals how to cast out demons, but they didn't do it in the name of Jesus. They just did it as a matter of functioning uh, religiously. And, but they decided, well, Paul has success, so let's do what Paul did. Paul's success came using the name of Jesus. And, you know, if you've ever heard or th thought or, you know, we haven't always been Christians or you've done, th people think that a, 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 a cross or a Bible or some other ritual is the key to getting people free. And so, well, let's see if we can get people free by using the name of Jesus. Uh, the only problem is they were using it as a ritual. They were using it sort of as a, an incantation. They weren't using it uh, as someone that was in relationship with Jesus under authority to Jesus. And so when they tried to do the same thing, the person they were praying for, they say, well, wait a minute, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul is, because they said in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. They say, well, I know who Jesus is, I know who Paul is, but I have no idea who you are. You're not under authority. You're trying to use a name without authority, and we're not under that kind of authority. And the Bible says that guy just jumped on them and, uh, and uh, basically beat them to a pulp, stripped them naked. They ran out of the house naked, wounded. And I want to tell you something. The Bible goes on to say that everyone heard about it, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And that brings us back to where we want to, want to be. What is relevant in the rest of this passage, the last part of this passage, is that when this took place and fear fell upon them all, the presence of God came. And some of y'all think that when God comes, it's just a, a nice, warm, tickly uh, feeling. And it is sometimes, but I want you to know that God is incredibly majestic. God is so otherworldly. He is so bigger than what you think that even when the angels that have been in the presence of God show up, people fall on their face in fear and trembling because they've been in the presence of God. How much more when God's presence comes and the fear of God falls on the people? May the fear of God fall on us again. Amen? So, many of them, believers, and that's what's interesting, we're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about believers. Can you turn to somebody and just tell them, he's not talking about unbelievers. He's talking about believers. Because I want you to get this. He's talking about believers. Many of them, believers, began confessing and telling their deeds. Now, you could actually say their misdeeds. The things that they were doing, whether sins of commission or sins of omission, this is a church, the church in Ephesus, when the fear of God began to fall, they, the church, began to confess their deeds. Many of them, before they got saved, had been pro practitioners of magic. What does that mean? They practice witchcraft. Yeah, right. right? It's very common in that day. Right? So today we have things like, well, there's black magic and there's white magic. And uh, some Disney would want you to believe that black magic is bad and white magic is good. I'm here to tell you all magic is bad. Okay, we're talking about witchcraft. You're talking about the demonic. You're talking about accessing the spiritual realm outside of God's legitimate authority, which is Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So they had got saved, which is great. We want people to get saved, people that have been in witchcraft. People, we want them to get saved. That's what we want. But many of these people, here's, here's, the, here's the catch. Many of these people that had been saved, for some reason, they had been holding on to their collection of books. Right? The Bible makes it plain that the reason they were holding on to this books, you have to, it's implied, but it kind of makes it plain, is because they were worth a lot of money. Right? Perhaps it was the value that they had intrinsically, or it was the value that they had in their hearts on these books that caused them want to not to get rid of them. However, when they saw the power of God begin to move, 
all of a sudden, that's which, which they valued was instantly devalued when they saw God's power. And then when they saw, experienced God, then they became ready and willing. And again, we're talking about the church. We're talking about believers. Then they became ready and willing to finally rid themselves of the things that they'd been carrying. Anybody want to leave yet? All right. Let me give you an example. All right. When I first got saved, eons ago, right? Yeah. Hundreds of years ago, yeah. it was not uncommon to have a service where people brought to, their pl to the place all their paraphernalia. Right? They got saved. But they usually go to church to get saved, or they go to a meeting to get saved. So obviously they still have stuff at home, right? So if you're a drug addict and you get saved, you still might have needles at home. You might have pipes at home. You might have drugs at home, right? If you came out, of, uh, because when we were, we were uh, 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 when I was a teenager, the, the big thing was about talking about rock and roll and, and how rock and roll was evil and all that kind of stuff. And so when you got saved, you, didn't, you still had your records at home. Back then we had 8-track tapes. Some of y'all don't know what that is. We had cassette tapes, we had records, we had LPs, we had the, the little ones, 38s, uh, 30, what I think they're called, 38s, right? 35s, 45s, we had those. You still had them at home, right? And so what's happening, you get saved, and so then uh, you had the t-shirts, you had, uh, you know, all these posters and all. So what we would do is we would get, everybody would get saved, and then we would have a burning service. And everybody would go home and they'd gather all their stuff, all their paraphernalia. Now, you've got to be kidding. You might, it cost me thousands of dollars to save all that stuff. That's what I'm talking about. You see, even though you're saved, it, you're still fighting with the value that this thing has. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to just burn it? I don't want you to do anything. It's not about what I want you to do. It's what does God want you to do? Or him. This is not Paul saying, hey, you need to go home and get all your magic books and you need to bring them. He didn't do that. He just taught the word of the Lord. What happened? The power of God began to fall. And when the fear of the Lord began to fall, people went home and they said, I got to get this stuff out of my house. And but what would happen is they would go home when God was convicting them stuff. And before they had a chance to talk themselves out of it, they would get all their stuff gladly and bring them. And they would have a garbage can or they'd have a pile and they'd gather all this stuff up and then they would burn it and put it on the altar before the Lord. They would do this as the people did in our text, not secretly, but openly. Can we just be real honest, right? Sometimes if we're not careful, we forget where we came from. And we forget to talk like people that have been in the world. Listen, I didn't save till I was 21, and when I was in the world, I was in the world. Right? Whoa. When you get saved, you transfer from the world into the kingdom of God, but guess what comes with you? Some of your worldly thinking. Because it takes a while for that to be transformed, you know? And so what happens is it almost seems like nowadays when somebody gets saved and, you know, you would have a burning service, uh, sometimes the church would go, oh, I can't believe, oh, you forgot where you came from. You forgot that you have, used to have this stuff in your home. Unless you grew up in a Christian home, you know, whatever the case may be, when none of that was there. Many of us, if not most of us, did not. And so it shouldn't be something that we're afraid to talk about. It shouldn't be something that we're embarrassed about other than the sense that if we've been a Christian for a while and we've been holding on to it. But at some point when God's presence begins to move, it's like, I know it's there. God knows it's there. I don't care who knows it's there. I just want to be free. So, they would do these things not secretly, but openly, putting their secret idols, sins, attachments before the congregation, and together submitting them before the Lord. Now, while you can do that with physical things, there are also other things that you can see that we can just as much place on the altar and submit to God. Lusts. You can't see it. 
unforgiveness. You can't see it. Now I'm talking about it. It'll work itself out somewhere down the road, but you can't really see it, right? Yeah. Envy, jealousy, uh, pride. You can't see those things, but God still wants to get those things out of our lives. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? James 5 and 16 says, Confess your faults, confess your trespasses one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. <gasps> no, I don't want anybody to know. And that's why you're struggling, because you're, approved, you're refusing to bring the things that we do in darkness into the light. And God is light, and the enemy is the opposite of that, is darkness. Anything you're unwilling to bring to the light, you allow the enemy the opportunity to mess with you. Well, I don't want anybody to know. They probably already know anyway. <laughs> Just telling you. Right? So, the first point we want to look at is believers, not unbelievers, believers had stuff in their homes. Now, their house. This can be your house. But it also could be your house. Acts 19, 18 through 19. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And here's the key. And they counted up the value of them in a total of 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, I don't know about how much that was worth back then, but I believe it was worth a lot more than it is today. But I want to tell you something today. I'd feel pretty good if I had 50,000 pieces of silver. You, you know what I'm saying? If you add 100 to that, you're talking about 50, 500, 5 million dollars? If they were each worth $100? You're talking about 5 million dollars? What, are they worth $1,000? You're talking about 50 million dollars? That's one city and just believers. What we need to see here is that the Bible is talking about believers. When it's talking about believers, it's talking about people that had given their lives to the Lord. In fact, based on the fact that Paul thought it was extremely important that people receive the baptism of Jesus, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we saw in the first part of this chapter, I think it would be safe to suppose that these believers had heard and were most likely baptized in the Holy Spirit. It, just in case you think, well, he's not talking to me. He's talking to that Baptist church up there. He's talking to that Methodist church up there. But he's not talking to us. We're saved and spirit-filled. Well, we're talking about people that have been saved. And most likely we're spirit-filled because the word of the Lord had reached all of Asia. And remember, Acts 19, 1 through 2, when Paul arrived, uh, having passed through the upper regions, he came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The first question he asked them. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So you think Paul would preach for two years without telling him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and without them receiving the baptism? Absolutely not. It was normal there. So we're talking about saved, spirit-filled believers, and it was these born-again, spirit-filled believers that, were, that we see being rocked by the fear of God and the power of God. And these believers now, after two years, two years being in church, Two years being spirit-filled, after two years of awesome spirit-filled services, the power of God began to fall, and when the power of God began to fall, the fear of God began to move through them, and after two years of being Christians, they came confessing their sins and divulging their practices. Now let me reiterate, these are not unbelievers, but believers. The Bible even goes so far as to say what their practices were. They were holding on to their past. Many of them had practiced magic arts. When they got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, they did not necessarily feel the need to get rid of these things from their lives. Instead, they held on to them. I'm, I'm, I understand new believers. I understand uh, the process of growth, and I understand God has to do some things in life, but it just absolutely is un, not understandable to me how after periods of time Christians can still be involved in questionable practices. So what I mean, what do you mean? Well, I don't practice witchcraft, but how much witchcraft do you allow in your home through television? Yeah. Right? Um, Christian yoga. Is there even such a thing? No. Right? No, well, you know, it's okay, you know, whatever the case may be. Is it okay? Other things 
that Christians do. And my point here is not to name thing after thing after thing, although if Charles, Charles Finney was here, he would. He'd look at you and they'd say, I saw you doing this, and I saw you doing that, and I saw you doing that, and this is absolutely wrong. Well, I'm not Charles Finney, but the Holy Spirit is the same. And I believe he's talking to people's hearts here today. Amen? They didn't feel the need to get rid of these things from their lives and said they held on to them. Why? We don't really know, except we can surmise that because they valued them so greatly, they held on to them because they carried a high value for them in their hearts. So basically, they weren't quite willing to let go of these things because of how much they cost and how much they meant to them because it had been such a big part of their prior lives. How many people are unwilling to let go of their friends that are dragging them down because they value them so much? We're not saying that you shouldn't care about your friends. We're not saying that you shouldn't pray for them. But if their influence on you is pulling you down and away from the Lord, instead of you pulling them up, then you need to ditch them and let them go. I'm not preaching on what you wear and all that kind of stuff today, but I imagine for some of y'all it's probably still hurting anyway. So what does this have to do with us? Well, we're a church filled with believers in Christ, I hope, right? We've been born again, right? We've espoused and hopefully embraced the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? As such, you would think that we, like the believers in our text, are good. Yet the likelihood is that there's still stuff in our closets. There's still stuff in our homes. There's still stuff in our houses that we're holding on to that we have not yet seen the importance of letting go. Being born again and being baptized in the Holy Spirit does not mean that you are necessarily healed and whole in every dimension of your life. It means you're saved. Sanctification is a process in which we constantly, in submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, bring areas of our lives into the light and give them over to Him to be free of the things that we have in some ways treasured or have been unwilling to let go. Right? Uh, yesterday, I invited... Uh, I'm going to get in trouble for this probably. I invited Marty over to the house to have something to eat. I said she was making some, some caldo, and I really like Anna's caldo a lot. And I think anybody that has her caldo likes it a lot. It's, it's soup. It's a Mexican soup. Caldo. I say caldo because I'm talking to gringos. It's caldo. Caldo de pollo. Really, really good, man. And I said, I like to invite Marty over. And she says, well, the house isn't clean. Right? I don't want him coming in and seeing my stuff. I said, well, I'll give you 20, 30 minutes. She said, okay, because she wants to clean the house up, whatever the case may be, right? Pray for me. <laughs> but how many of us, if we invited Jesus into our homes, we would say, okay, but you can't go in there. <gasps> you know what? I never thought about it before, but this... This thing is questionable. I want Jesus to see that. Right? Uh, uh, wait a minute. I need to put these books away. I don't want Jesus to see that. I, I don't want this little Buddha that I got over here. I don't think Jesus would be happy with that. This little wind catcher I got over here. I don't think Jesus would be happy with that. Right? This stuff that here, you know, I don't think Jesus would be happy with that. Well, here's the thing. That's if Jesus was coming over. But here's the thing. Jesus lives inside of you. He comes over every day. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we feel convicted if Jesus is coming over. What I'm trying to get you to really understand is that if you feel convicted that Jesus would come over and see some things in your life that aren't supposed to be there, then what you're doing is you're really keeping God at bay. You're keeping him out of areas of your life that you think as long as it stays in the dark, God doesn't see them. And it's the mercy of God that prevents those things from really doing damage in our lives. It's the mercy of God that wants to bring those things into the light. It's the mercy of God that the fear of God moves in our lives to deal with those things in us so that we can bring them to Him and that we can be free of that so that the enemy no longer has sway in our lives. 
But I want to tell you something. If we don't respond to the mercy of God and the fear of God, then what begins to happen is that the enemy of God begins to have more and more sway in our lives. And when God, in His mercy, allows the enemy to, to, to deal with us, it can be so uh, downright, not just confusing, but it can just basically bring almost sheer destruction into your life. And God doesn't want that in your life. I know been through it and the the more that you grow in God the deeper you grow in God the more the enemy wants to take you out you hear what I'm saying so what are we talking about so what we're talking about is you grow in God these things that we thought weren't important you all of a sudden need to recognize they are important these things that you thought you could keep outside, you, don't, you could keep hidden, they're no longer, they're not hidden from God. These things, God knows they're there, but the enemy knows they're there as well. And it's kind of like for him, an invitation to come in. Yeah. Yeah. Or hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, what could it be? What are things are you talking about? Well, it could be something like the Ephesians things that we used to do that we haven't let go. It could be things we identified with in the past that somehow in following after Christ we've not yet been willing to get rid of. Maybe some secret sin that we've been holding on to. Or it could be some past trauma that shaped our lives that we've been unwilling to deal with. It could be unforgiveness that we have towards others that we still hold on to. And not only are we, willing to, we, are, uh, not only are we unwilling to bring them to the light, but are even less likely to the, lay them on the altar before God. It's a way of thinking that says, well, it's okay. I mean, I know it's wrong for other people, but Jesus is good with me. We're good. Right? As long as I don't feel bad about it, then, then it must be okay. No. If it's strictly forbidden in the Word of God, it's wrong. Right? What is some, uh, we talk about this all the time. Uh, uh, homosexuality. What does the Bible say about it? Well, God understands. Does He? Well, I can go to another church where they say it's okay. I don't care what another church says. I care what this says. What about sex before marriage? What does the Bible say? Right? We call it benefits God calls it sin yeah. wrong right you hear what I'm saying there's a lot of things the world wants to dumb down wants to bring the conviction out of but the problem is if you allow these things to continue in your life it's not so much one thing is that God can only come so close but the enemy comes closer and when he starts coming closer, we open doors. And right now, you may be in a, in a place where you don't have a lot of responsibility, but the higher you go in God, I was trying to tell Marty, it's kind of like the higher you grow in leadership, it's like a diver that goes underwater. If you're at sea level and you have a leak in your, in your, uh, in your suit, it's not going to really be that impactful. But if you're one atmosphere down and you have a leak in your suit, it's going to be pretty bad. If you're three atmospheres down and you have a leak in your suit, it's going to be worse. What if you're ten atmospheres down? Well, what happens is the, 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 the more you dive, the greater the pressure. And I want you to know the higher you go up in God, the greater the responsibility. Right? And so there are things that you could get away with when you were a brand new believer that as you grow in the Lord and you have more responsibility, you can no longer get away with those things like you used to before. And that's what I'm saying. That's why sanctification is a process. It continues throughout the Christian life. Still shedding stuff, still letting stuff go. And I've been serving God since 1985. I think that's 37 years or 38 years, something like that, right? It doesn't ever stop. Lord highlights things in our lives not to hurt us, not to, to bring pain in our lives, but to free us so that we can walk in holiness and in health, right? 
Matthew 16, 24 through 25, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires, desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I use this illustration quite often. I know there's some new people in here, those of you that have heard it. It's still good to reinforce things. But in John 11, 43 through 44, when Jesus brought life to Lazarus, who, who was dead, he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and feet with, well, were bound with linen strips, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. He didn't say to Lazarus, unbind yourself. He said to the people around him, unbind him and let him go. What happened? Lazarus was dead. Now, do you know that before we're saved, we are dead in our trespasses and sins? And Jesus shows up and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he spoke life into Lazarus, and Lazarus had a resurrection. When we get saved, we move from death to life. We have a resurrection. But Lazarus came out with life in him, but he was still bound. And what we often think is, well, I'm saved, I'm free. You are saved, but you're still bound in many areas of your life. Freedom is in Christ. You have the inheritance of freedom, but you've got to take these things that are binding you off. And it has to do with changing the way you think, changes the way you behave, being willing to bring things to the light. And it's a process that takes time. <laughs> is there anybody here saying, I didn't sign up for this? Well... So the second thing we want to look at is the word grew and prevailed. So Acts 19 uh, and uh, 20 says, The word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. First of all, let me say that the word of the Lord is powerful. God's word is powerful, right? So well, I'm not sure about that. Well, let me see if I can reinforce that. Thank you for bringing that up. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. It didn't say it's powerful. It is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, right? Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Isaiah 55 and 11. My word uh, that comes out of my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What we see in our text is that for the word of God to prevail in our life and for the power of God to continue to have sway in us, we do have a part to play. God's word is powerful. Just like a seed, one seed has the power to reproduce an entire forest. A power within that seed. But it has to find a place that will receive it. It has to find a heart that will receive it. The word of God can bring forth a lot of fruit, but only if it finds a heart, a soil that it can be planted in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Matthew 13, 20 through 22 says, As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arise on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it proves un. Fruitful. What we see in this parable is that the word of God that is sown has the power to transform the lives of the hearts the word is sown into because that's what the soil is. It's the, it's the human heart, different hearts, right? However, there are two things named in this parable that have the potential to stunt the potential of what the power of God's word can do in the life of a believer. Those two things are hidden stones in the soil and thorns. You hear what I'm saying? Both of these need to be dealt with in order for the soil to become suitable for maximum fruitfulness. So, the Word of God is planted in your heart. The Word of God is like seed. It's, it's sown into your heart, and you're excited. It's wonderful. It's great. But then all of a sudden, uh, is that seed going to find good soil? Is it going to find good fruit? Wait a minute. It's growing and growing, but there's a, sto a stone in your heart. What is that stone? could be something of value that you're unwilling to let go. Could be unforgiveness. 
could be a practice that you're doing. You're unwilling to, to, to let God have it in your life. And so what happens, that stone impedes the growth of the Word of God in your life, and you become stunted. And then what happens when affliction or persecution arises because of the Word, and I promise you that affliction and persecution will arise, because there is an enemy... And he wants nothing more than for you to turn away from God. He wants nothing more than the Word of God to become unfruitful in your life. And so he will tell you things like, you can still do that and be a Christian. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to forgive them to be a Christian. You don't have to get rid of this to be a Christian. You can still practice this and be a Christian. You know, that pastor, he just, he's, a, he's, a, he's a fanatic. You don't have to be fanatical. You'll have people come in your life and say, serve God, but don't be a fanatic. Well, I'm a fan of Christ, and if I'm a fan of Christ and I want to follow Him, I find no other way in the Bible than to be what the world would call a fanatic. I am 100% committed to following God and doing whatever He says in my life. Now, I say that, but I always pray. I say, God, help me to do what I want to do, which is be completely open to You. Because I understand some things are hard and some things are a struggle, but I want God more than anything in my life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So there are hidden stones in the soil that when the fear of God and the presence of God begins to move in your life, and God says, I want this from you, maybe before you said, nah, maybe before it's too hard, it's too deep, it's too big. You know, God never intended that you do it yourself anyway. He just wants you to give it to Him. And then he'll help pull it out of your life so that the word of God can grow stronger in your life so that you can bear fruit, right? Now, those are stones, but the other things in your life that can impede the the, the growth of God is thorns, right? What are thorns? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts, the other lusts, I think it says in the book of Mark, and the lusts, the other lusts of the world that, that, that's in the world, the other things of lust. Anyway, what it's talking about is these things become more important to you in life, yeah. right? What your friends think become more important to you than what God thinks. Yeah. You're hearing what I'm saying? What, uh, what, what the people, uh, uh, um, and, and let's put it this way, what they feel about you on Facebook becomes more important than what it says in the Word of God. Political correctness becomes more important to you than what the Word of God says, right? Or now, well, God is good. I see what God says in His Word. He wants to bless me, and so I begin to work, and and as I begin to work, all of a sudden I begin more focused on how much money that I can make and whether or not this becomes a glorious thing to the Lord. And the next thing you know, the promise of overtime, the hope of getting a new boat, the hope of getting a bigger house, all these things become so important to me that I no longer do the things that I needed to do to be a good Christian, which is read my Bible, which is go to church, which is give uh, to the Lord. I no longer do these things because the cares of this world have become more important to me. And the deceitfulness of riches whether they be the hardness of the stone or the deceitfulness of the thorn they both serve to impede the word from bearing fruit in your lives the holy spirit moves on us to deal with these things in us but without our cooperation because god does value free will he won't take it from you uh, by by coming in and forcefully removing it from you but if you willfully give it to him he will take it from you These things, if we don't do so, will continue to be obstacles to what God truly wants to do in us. So what is the answer? The answer is to do what these believers in our text did. Acts 19, 18 through 20, many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Apparently they thought being free was more important than what people thought about it. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. What can we learn from that? Well, I didn't put it in here, but I'm thinking about it right now. What can we learn from that is that there is probably more than just one person. You're not the only one going through what you're going through. 
there are other people in this body struggling with stuff. And the other thing I want to tell you something is whatever you're struggling with, nobody's here to condemn. Nobody's here to judge. What we want to do is we want to see you free. I've been there. We've been there. We know what it is. We want to see you free. You don't need to go through the pain. You don't need to go through the pain that I went through. I don't want you to go through that pain. Pain. You don't need that anymore. I don't want that for you anymore. It hurts, but I'm so grateful he loved me enough to do that. I'm so grateful. I'm not who I was. And I hope that next year I won't be who I am. I hope every year that he draws me closer to me. I'm telling you, the best thing you can do is bring your stuff to the Lord. Deal with your stuff. The church brought their quote-unquote valuables into the light by confessing and telling their deeds. And it's amazing that these things I thought were so valuable, they burned them. Apparently they weren't that valuable. And they put them away forever. What we see here is not only confession of sins, but a willingness to be accountable to each other. When that happened, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. That means that the power of God was unleashed in their midst in an even greater way. We pray and we pray and we say, God, move. God, let your Shekinah glory fall. God, let your presence come. And I believe that God is answering that prayer and wants to answer that prayer. So what prevents the word of the Lord from prevailing? I don't think it's always God except in his mercy. I think what prevents the word of the Lord from prevailing is our unwillingness sometimes to let go of the things that we have held on to in life. But as we bring these things to the Lord, uh, I said before, the word of the Lord is like a two-edged sword. It does hurt going in, but it heals on its way out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's like cutting away cancer. It's hard. It hurts. But after it's gone, the joy that comes from being free outweighs any pain that you go through. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What we see here is not only confession of sins, but a willingness to be accountable to each other. When that happened, the word of the Lord grew mightily. Why? No more obstructions. No more stones. No more thorns. Right? It grew mightily and prevailed. That means it did what it was meant to do, overcome. That means the power of God was unleashed. James 5 and 16 says, Confess your trespasses one to another. He's talking to the church. He doesn't say go to a priest in private and confess your faults. We're not saying you need to publicly confess your faults to everyone in the church, but it does say we need to hold each other accountable. And I promise you, you're not the only one going through what you're going through. You're not the only one that has ever sinned in the way you've sinned. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It reminds me, and I've told this story before, but it says pray for one another. Sometimes the person that is going to pray for you is the person you have ought with. And that's where true healing comes, not just in the fact that you've uh, brought what was hidden into the light, but there's also reconciliation. You say, well, God wouldn't do that. I don't know what God you know, but my God does things like that. He says, if you go to the altar and realize that you have ought with somebody, leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to that person first. Then bring your gift to the altar. So it seems to me that God values relationship more than he does what you can give him. I said before, God was moving in our midst. We saw that. How many of y'all thought that was wonderful? How many of y'all want more of that? How many of y'all think that I messed it up by coming and talking about this stuff? No. I want more of that to happen. I want more of that to take place. So what has to happen in order for that to take place is there has to be 
a fear of the Lord move through our midst, the presence of God move through our midst, and an awareness of the things that I'm doing that I could do before I really can't do anymore, and a submission to God, and bringing those things to God, and saying, God, I want to bring this to the light. You already know it's there, because nothing's hidden from you, but I want to bring it to the light, and I want to hold myself accountable. I want other people to hold me accountable because I do have a weakness in an area. I do have a struggle in this area, but I believe that if two or three are gathered in His name, and if we can agree about it, we can pray about it, I believe that together I can experience the victory of God in my life. What do I do now? I don't know. Do I ask you to raise your hands? Yeah, I got sin in my life. What do we do? I think probably the best thing to do is if the Lord is speaking to you, then I would ask you to just find a place at these altars up here. Find a place at these altars. I believe the Spirit of God is moving. I believe it's speaking to hearts. And there's really a couple of things that we can do. One is we can fold our hands and say, mm, never coming back to this church again. Who told him I was coming? Another thing we can do is just feel nothing. Not get angry. Not repent. What was it? Jacob was in a place where the presence of the Lord was. He had a dream where the, the ladder touched the heaven and, and the bottom touched the earth and he saw the angels of God coming and going and he said to himself when he woke, woke up, this is Bethel, this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. He said, the presence of the Lord is in this place and I didn't even know it. What does that mean? Sometimes the God is moving and some people are saying, wow, the presence of God is in this place and other people are saying, I didn't even know it. The other thing we can do is we can say, I believe the Lord is talking to me. And I want to respond. I want God more than anything in my life. And I want to respond. I want to do what God's asking me to do. I want to become all that God wants from me. And if I got to shed something, if I got to get rid of something, if I got to bring something, in fact, we probably should have some kind of container here that next time you come back to church or you should come back tonight and bring your stuff with you. No, 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 no. I don't know. Why would the Lord put this on my heart if there wasn't stuff going on? All I can say is if the Lord's every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be specific with your people. Be specific with me. If there are things that you want us to shed, things that we need to bring to the light, things that we need to expose of ourselves uh, to get rid of, the things that we value, the things that we hold on to, we need to get rid of them, Lord. I pray that you would show it to us even now. And if the Lord is speaking to you, and I want you to get up. I want you to find a place at the altar. And I want you to give it to the Lord.